Okay, so we will start this joint seminar. I want to thank Benoit Lebeau. He's, uh, he has many lives. I, I learned about his many lives uh, at lunchtime. Uh, he's now at the Ministry uh, for the Ecological Transition, Ecological and Inclusive Transition, if I understand. No more inclusive. No more inclusive, so. And, uh, <laughs> and he will talk about energy efficiency. He's also... Um, he was also the first president of the of a very important association that i mean uh, you will have a presentation of this association and its scenario at uh, at the second joint seminar negawatts uh, so thank you very much for being here today and uh, i give you the floor for one hour okay for one hour well, good afternoon good afternoon and uh, great to be in front of you i'm always happy to share views on uh, things that count in our life and uh, there's nothing more important than to uh, understand the world we live in and why we need to change this world yeah, <laughs> yeah it's better for you okay so my name is benoit le beau le boat le bolt the bolt if you prefer. I uh, currently work at the French Ministry of Ecological Transition, but this is fairly recent. Um, I've only done one thing in my life since I started to work on climate change in 1987. 1987. This is when I started at the end of my uh, study. I uh, started to uh, understand the link between energy and climate change. And at the time in 87, we were not too many people interested in the topic um, there's one thing i've done in my life i don't know how many of you are familiar with this have you seen this lay this logo this label have you seen it most of you is there someone who has not seen it you are all familiar you know what that is this is a label that we put on the fridge on the tv on the buildings to indicate that this appliance consume some lot of energy or not so much energy this is one of the product of my career i've been involved in the design the implementation of the of the very first policy to uh, in europe to introduce uh, a signal to address climate change the very first european policy to help the consumer understand climate change is this label and i've been involved in that one in my whole life i've only done one thing saving energy i work for i studied first in the u.s in the university of california at berkeley and i did a master there and then i uh, studied uh, i did some work for the u.s department of energy then i moved back to france to work for the french national energy transition agency then I moved to Paris to join the OECD and to work for the International Energy Agency during six years. And then I joined the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. If you know the UN world, the UNDP is the largest UN organization. And during 10 years, I was involved in the teams to support economies in transition or the i was based in africa at the time and to support uh, the country to uh, uh, address climate change i did that for 10 years then i moved back to paris to join the special collaboration of the g20 countries on energy efficiency and uh, over the past two years i'm uh, now back uh, i'm uh, working for the french ministry of ecological transition i don't only one thing in my life is to uh, um, take part in the debate to make sure that energy efficiency is understood and is being used as a pillar of the energy transition. I have a few things to share with you. Um, what I will present to you is a summary of uh, what I consider is important to convince you to think the way uh, the energy transition is. Everything everyone does every day and everywhere requires energy. 
there's not a single moment now in our life where we don't consume some energy. It's so important. We are fully addicted to energy. Energy is the lifeblood of economic and human development. Without energy, no development. And this is why there is such a great correlation between growth, the GDP, and energy, and that we need to decorrelate that. But we are truly addictive on, climate, on, on, on energy. I've been lucky enough to uh, work in many countries, and in particular in Africa, and now we have a great understanding of the world, and this is a satellite view of a sunset between Europe and Africa, and as you can see, uh, when the night comes, the lights are turned on, and you can see a massive in the west uh, in Europe, a massive street lighting. This is waste of energy, by the way, because all the lights that we see from above is just a pure waste. We are supposed to have some street lighting to uh, to lead the the streets downstairs, not not not, not upwards. And you can see that in. Uh, uh, on the African continent, there is even some uh, light. Do you know what that is? There's a lot of lights here in the Guinea Gulf. This is uh, oil uh, uh, gas extraction, oil and gas extraction. And you know, this is where they burn the methane when you extract oil. And this, there's enough waste of gas here that uh, could be uh, sufficient to uh, provide uh, electricity for the whole African continent. But this is part of uh, our system. I'm showing that to you because here there's a big white masses. You know what that is? Sahara, yes. And uh, I, when I was working for UNDP, I was based in Senegal, Dakar. I was working across the whole continent, but I was based in Dakar. And I've learned many things about Africa. I've learned that uh, Sahara, in the middle of Sahara today, you go in some places, Niger, Chad, you can find this type of uh, carvings in the, in, in, on the rocks in the middle of the desert. And I've learned that, in fact, 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, the Sahara was green. And today it's a desert. There was a climate change between when Sahara was green and today's land as we know it. This is Africa 15,000 years ago. And it was a green land with a lot of uh, the forest and the big mammals, and there was also many lakes, and now it's different. Closer to France, in fact, next to Marseille in the south of France, there is a cave that has been recently discovered. The name of the cave is Kosker. It's the name of a guy who discovered this cave and this beautiful painting on the walls. Paintings they were designed 19,000 years ago. You can see a penguin, penguin on the Mediterranean, a horse, and so on. And the reason why this cave was discovered only 30 years ago, exactly 1990, is because the entrance of the cave is below sea level, exactly 36 meters below sea level. And he took a diver, a professional diver called Mr. Kosker, to discover next to Marseille, uh, like an entrance and a natural gallery of almost 200 meter long. And when he moved up the gallery, he found this cave where he saw the painting here. According to you, 20,000 years ago, our ancestors, where could they dive 36 meters, dive under the, so for 200, no, of course not. I'm showing that to you to tell you that 10,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, it was the ice age. Planet Earth was totally different. The entrance of the cave was 10 kilometers away from the sea and 80 meters in altitude above sea level. 10,000 years ago, it was the ice age. 10,000, that was the end of the ice age. But during the ice age, in minus 20, minus 15,000 years ago, the earth was totally different. 
Sahara was green, sea level was below 120 meters worldwide. The level of sea was 120 meters worldwide. This is the Mediterranean Sea today. This is what it was 20, uh, 10, 15,000 years ago. And the whole world was very different. I'm showing that to you only to put in your mind five degrees Celsius. The difference between the ice age and today is five degrees Celsius less on average. And few degrees is nothing. It's a huge impact for just the way uh, planet Earth is organized. As you can see here, this is a map of the ice age 20,000 years ago. And you can see the ice cap covering North Africa. There was three kilometers of ice on the level of New York City. The whole Scandinavia was under ice. And when we have a closer look at Europe, for instance, we see that Scandinavia is under ice. There was no British or Irish island. Our ancestors could walk from uh, European mainland all the way to uh, where the uh, uh, island is. And, um, and, and, and once again, there's only one thing to remember. It was 15 years, uh, five degrees Celsius compared to them today. Few degrees change, totally changed the face of planet Earth. This is, by the way, why the Bering Strait 15,000 years ago was um, uh, uh, you could walk from uh, Asia, for East Asia to west of the North American continent. And this explained because of the ice age, the oceans were lower than 120 meters, the ice cap and so on. Anyway, five degrees Celsius this is all <laughs> I want you to keep from that. So today the average temperature on Earth is plus 15 degrees C, plus 15 degrees C. It was 10 at the ice age. Of course, you know climate change. Of course, you know the greenhouse effect. This is a greenhouse effect. You leave a car under the sun. When you go back to the car, it's warm inside the car, isn't it? We have the same phenomenon around the planet Earth. With the atmosphere, the average temperature at the Earth's surface is plus 15 degrees C, OK? If we didn't have atmosphere, the average temperature would be minus 18 degrees C. So we owe a lot because with the atmosphere, we are capturing the heat from the sun at the surface. And uh, without this layer of greenhouse gases, is like the windshield of the car, we wouldn't be able to maintain an average temperature on planet Earth on average. It was 10 degrees C during the ice age. Okay? If I, what is the most important greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? What will you say? What is the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere? Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> because this is very unique that I receive this. Usually, I, I, I hear the whole long list of greenhouse gases from the F gas to uh, methane and CO2. But indeed, far the most important greenhouse gas, the clouds that we see in the sky, very important. Is this a problem? Water takes part in the natural cycle of evaporation, transport in the clouds, and precipitation, OK? Another number to put in your head. One molecule of water, during the time it gets evaporated, transported, and dropped as rain, lasts 10 days in the atmosphere. 10 days. So in the case of a warmer climate, there will be maybe an acceleration of more evaporation, more transport, more precipitation. But a molecule of water will last 10 days in the atmosphere. Okay, 10 days. We have all the greenhouse gas. We have uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and uh, nitrous oxide. And we have even some gases that were non-existent a century ago. We have invented a series of so-called F-gas. And the F-gas are so practical, so convenient. They provide us multiple services like 
uh, air conditioning, refrigeration, but those gases are totally non-toxic for us human beings. But when they have been used, they go in the atmosphere and we can see that every molecule of an F gas has a weight of 10,000 times, 10,000 times greater than one molecule of carbon. And carbon belongs to another cycle on planet Earth, okay? The breathing and photosynthesis. The animals, we absorb oxygen, we emit CO2, and the plants are doing exactly the opposite. They capture CO2 and they transform via the photosynthesis into biomass, okay? So during many, many, many years, there was a perfect, perfect equilibrium between what was emitted as CO2 naturally and what was captured by the biomass, the land biomass and also the sea biomass in the ocean. And suddenly, uh, as we develop in the 18th century in UK, they found an alternative. They were starting to face a problem with lack of wood and they found an alternative called mineral coal. And they started to dig underground to look for coal, to burn the coal. And we started at that very moment, 1750. We started to emit more carbon than we were able to capture. At the very moment, the population grew and we stop, um, we, we, uh, we, we, we continue to cut trees and to deforest. So we were introducing, uh, we were reducing the possibility of planet Earth to absorb. We were digging from the underground some carbon in the form of solid called uh, mineral coal. And then we started to emit more and more CO2. And there was, uh, we could see a start of uh, accumulation because one molecule of CO2 lasts in the atmosphere between 80 years and 1,000 years. One molecule of CO2, it's 10 days. One molecule of water, 10 days. One molecule of CO2, on average, 120 years. This is where we don't understand climate change. We have to stop if we want to want if we are serious about climate change, we have to understand those fundamentals of climate change. This is why I insist here that uh, sending a, a, a molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere will have an impact for 120 years on average, okay? And not only we started to dig ground from the ground some mineral coal, but we have found oil later on and then gas. And we have been using massively those fossil energy to um, uh, fuel the economic development, and we saw a boom in economic development. The relation between us and energy is not at all linear. Between 1900 and 2000, the total population was multiplied by four. We moved from a world of 1.5 billion people on planet Earth to 6 billion in 2000. You know that in November, last November, we reached 8 billion people. Since uh, 2000, 2 billion more people <laughs> joined Earth on planet Earth. But at the very same time, over the same period, the energy that we consume was multiplied by 16. Energy is development. Energy is the lifeblood of any economic and human development, right? And we could see that in this very well-known graph over the 200th century, this is a report of all the energy that we, are, we have been using. You see at the very bottom, this is biomass. During many, many years, we, uh, biomass was the main source of energy, mostly, okay? Burning wood to heat or to prepare food. And then we start to see carbon, uh, uh, charcoal, uh, charcoal, coal, mineral coal, and then the discovery of oil, and then gas, and then uh, nuclear, and, and uh, now renewable energy. But you can see between 1900 
and 2000, the multiplication of 16. The graph also shows us here that every time we have discovered a new resource, a new energy resource, we have never seen a replacement of the old existing resource by the new one. It has all, always come on top. Oil, the discovery of oil has not replaced coal. The discovery of gas has not replaced oil or coal. It came in addition. This is to uh, say that when there is a new form of energy, until now, the new form of energy, nuclear or the renewable energy that we all love, today they come in addition. And we'll see that this is not sustainable. To understand climate change, I'd like to show this illustration. I have prepared this type of presentation long time ago to present to some ministers because throughout my career, I could understand that even the most important people in our world don't understand climate change. So, so I, I started to develop this type of uh, graphic to illustrate what we have above our head. Above our head, until 19, uh, uh, until 15, uh, 1750, we had a perfect equilibrium between the greenhouse gas emission pouring in the atmosphere, taking part in the concentration, and what was captured by biomass. You're with me? And the emissions were equal to the drain here, okay? So there was a perfect stability in the concentration. And during 10,000 since we left the ice age, it was a perfect stability in ppm, parts per million of greenhouse gas. To, uh, to, uh, what happened since we started to dig for underground oil, coal, and gas, we have added a big tap, a bigger tap. At the same time, we have reduced the potential for sequestration because we have cut the forest to open some new uh, land for agriculture production and also to establish the cities. So at the same time, we reduce the drain. We open a wide tap. As a consequence, the level rise. And this is uh, why greenhouse gas concentration is increasing, is increasing as, as we speak every day, okay? We don't only have one big tap that will be too easy. We have as many taps as we have different types of greenhouse gases. I mentioned the F gas, and proto, uh, nitrous oxide, the methane, and so on. We have as many taps as we have countries. We have as many taps as individuals. If we were, if, in this room, we were doing our own assessment of our carbon footprint. I'm sure that some of you will have bigger tab than others. And sometimes by a factor, by a big factor, okay? What we know is that with the increase of greenhouse gas concentration, planet Earth is warming. We have already engaged a warming of 1.2 degree since we started to dig all coal and gas from underground. We have increased by one degree Celsius and we are already facing climate change in this world just because of this small increase in by 1.2 degrees C, okay? You know that. In 2015 in Paris, there was a big agreement through the UN to accept that if we want to maintain a decent level of life, we have absolutely to limit the level of concentration in atmosphere to not exceed two degrees Celsius warming by the end of the century, okay? Two degrees. This two degree targets translate into a level that we should not exceed exactly 450 ppm. And we know exactly the amount of carbon that we have left to emit in the atmosphere, to limit the temperature below two degrees. 
do you know that at the current pace and volume of greenhouse gas that we continue to emit today, this quantity, this amount, this volume, this carbon budget that we have, we will reach it before 2040. So this is a level of the equation. We know that we have 40 gigatons, billion tons. Here we have a tap. Can we increase the drain here? Can we open, can we stop deforestation? Yes. Can we reforest? Yes. Can we change some, uh, the way we use land and, 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 and agriculture? Yes. But we can increase that by 10 to 20%. If we want to remain under the budget, we have absolutely no choice but to reduce dramatically the amount of greenhouse gas emission. And it is to the point that now we have almost to reduce to zero here. We have lost so many times, so many years, because we don't understand climate change, because we don't understand the fundamentals of climate change, because we don't believe what we know, that what science is telling us. And we have now very little time to make sure that this type of greenhouse gas emission from our activity is brought to zero. At the same time, we also have to, of course, stop deforestation and so on. So greenhouse gas layer gets thicker. This is the warmest year. Oh, it says the warmest year ranked by the by, by the most uh, by the warmest year. And uh, I just uh, introduced 2021 here. So anyway, the warmest year on record are the most recent one. And climate change is opening every day in this world now. So this is a picture from last uh, 2021. Uh, those are pictures from 20 of climate change, between uh, the flood, the famine, and when you, you know that by heart. To, to understand, climate change, we have three parameters that change. Temperature, precipitation, and sea level rise. Temperature and precipitation because of the science of climate change. Precipitation because of the acceleration of the water cycle, right? Sea level for two reasons, you know, uh, because the ice cap on the mainland is melting. So there is uh, uh, some contribution to sea level, but also there is, um, as water gets warmer, ocean gets warmer, they take more space, they dilate, they, 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 there's more room taken by the, uh, uh, there's more volume taken by uh, warmer ocean, so sea level rise. The impact is uh, on everything, on health, on agriculture, on forest, on um, access to water, on coastline, there's coastline erosion. This is happening in many places around planet Earth and impact on biodiversity. Biodiversity was already facing a major loss, as you know, and climate change on top of that make the loss of biodiversity even faster and bigger. Anyway, all what we know about development is being affected directly or indirectly as a consequence of climate change. This is a map of the world indicating the country that are the most vulnerable to climate change. In blue, the bluer, the more vulnerable the country is. And we see here that the most vulnerable countries to climate change are the ones that have contributed the least to the problem. If I was from uh, one of those countries, I would be furious, totally furious against the developed world because uh, they are suffering and they're already suffering now and they will suffer much more because of uh, the reality of climate change and climate change because of the use of energy from fossil energy and because of the massive use of energy that we had in the north to develop. <laughs> um, this is a map from NASA. You can find it online. It's a world where we would fail in addressing climate change. And this is a, a world warmer by four degrees Celsius, four degrees Celsius. In orange here, you see inhabitable land, inhabitable land. No way human life can stand through the year. And the only possibility we have for 
food production is a green pad, Siberia and, uh, and north of Canada. And there's some uncertainties on some part of the, and where we may have a potential for reforestation because of change of uh, rain patterns and so on. But there's a lot of uncertainties on this one. Anyway, that doesn't leave us with too many options. And we, despite all what we know, we still continue to emit greenhouse gas emissions in this world. We have to adapt to climate change. And any activity over time may be affected by some climate event. And any activity, and as soon as there is a climate event, there is a drop in activity. Take any activity. And then you will take the time. So adapting to climate change, there is four steps. We have first to resist. We have to develop the ability to resist. We have to develop the ability to absorb a changing climate and the consequence. We have to enhance, uh, we have to de develop the ability to recover. And we also have the uh, ability to evolve. We can do maybe better. Anyway, this is no longer an option. Climate change is with us. We just have the possibility to limit it. And uh, when I read the IPCC report, you certainly have heard that last year there was a release of the new IPCC report, International Panel for Climate Change, the science of climate change. And those are my five main lessons. Things on climate change are worse than we thought. Loss and damage gets scientific backing. That was not the case before. Technology is not a silver bullet. We love technology. We all think that technology will solve it. No, technology is not a silver bullet. And we will see that there is as important as to change behavior, the way our attitude vis-a-vis -vis the energy system. Cities offer hope. We can no longer count on national government to take action. Climate change will be necessarily addressed at the local level. And we have to make sure that we bring the decentralized policy to make sure that uh, we address climate change at the level of where it is being faced and citizen. There is a very small window, and the window is closing fast. But of course, you know all that. This is a distribution of the global greenhouse gas emission. So we still have a six. 59% of the CO2 uh, greenhouse gas that we emit come from the combustion of coal, oil, and gas. 80% in the world come from fossil energy, oil, coal, and gas. We had exactly 80% 40 years ago. All the introduction of renewable energy have not changed the trajectory because the renewable energy, they can, in addition, to uh, the fossil energy, not to replace them. That's why we continue to go to move the world in, in the wrong direction. We see methane, we see nitrous oxide, this is change of agriculture, we see the F gas, very small but big impact, and we see here L UCF, the land use of change, land use change and forestry, so deforestation and change. Of course, we had the Paris Agreement, big celebration. But you know, today, we have an agreement to limit the warming at 2 degrees C. And we know the path in terms of global greenhouse gas emission over time in the next decades. We know that we have to move the greenhouse gas emission if we want to, to remain under 2 degrees on, on that trajectory. The ultimate goal would be 1.5 degrees. This is uh, the real agreement in Paris is to uh, try to target 1.5 degree. We have already 1.2 degree, huh? so 1.5. So this is in the challenge. When we take into account all the commitments done under the UN in today's world, this is where we are. NDC, uh, not, uh, nationally determined contribution. This is a commitment of all the countries in the world. And despite all what we know climate change, we continue to be on the wrong side of the equation, okay? So the war warming is happening everywhere. We have already um, increased the temperature by 1.2 degree, but it is in our hand. 
today to decide the temperature that will be in planet Earth at the end of the century. At the minimum, we should target two degrees, maybe less. But we are on the, the trend to increase the temperature by three, four, sometimes up to five degrees because there's some unknown. In less than a century, never, never in the history of planet Earth, there was such a rapid warming. Between the ice age and today's world, there was a warming over 10,000 years. We are having the same type of change in temperature in less than a century. This is unheard. Human being will not survive with seven, eight billion population uh, with a, a world above two degrees C. There is an imperative. Of course, you know there are many, many statistics that exist on the greenhouse gases. I put one number in your head. An average human beings, an average European produce every day one kilogram of trash per day. One kilogram of trash per day. Each of you, you live in Paris, at least this year, but you are in Paris, you produce in your daily life one kilogram of waste per day. You know the, the trash smells bad. You have to take that in the main trash downstairs. Do you know that the very same day, if you live in France, you emit 20 to 30 kilograms of CO2 per day? When we talk about environment and environmental protection, oh, I, I do something on my waste. And yes, we have to reduce this amount, yes. But the volume and the weight, when we consider greenhouse gas, is much, much greater, okay? And we have now to bring the two figures to zero by 2050. And this is an average, okay, for an average Frenchman. I just divided here the tons per capita per year, divided by the number of days. Huh? I prefer to talk in kilogram per day. So tons, no one has ever seen the ton or billion or a kilogram. I hope people picture it, okay? Uh, half of your weight, body weight, is being emitted in terms of weight per day. But there is a big difference between the poorest part of the population that emit a factor uh, uh, half the uh, the poorest the portion fifty percent of the poorest part of the population maybe just a uh, half of the average, and the upper part of the population, the wealthier part of the population, the ten percent wealthier, they emit five times, and this is where, if we address climate change, will inevitably inevitably we will. Uh, uh, face the issue of social and inclusiveness, the social dimension inclusiveness. There is more problem with the developed world, the rich part of the population than when. Most of the, the, the poorest part of the population are already on target, okay? This is the target, by the way, we have in France for 2030. So half of the population in France is already on target for 2030. The problem is the other half, and especially the the rich part of the population. Now to move on and to start exploring what can we do? We know that every system that we use, every energy system has a contribution to climate change. So let's take a car. You know all what is a car. A car emits some greenhouse gas emission. It can also emit some other type of greenhouse gas than just carbon dioxide. If you have air conditioning, you will have gas and so on. So anyway, a greenhouse gas is emitted by a system Call a car. Can you tell me the four complementary steps that we can use to reduce the emission of a system called a car? Can you tell me what comes to mind if we want to reduce the carbon footprint? What comes to mind? That's absolutely one solution, absolutely. We may have car, but we don't need necessarily to use them. That's absolutely right. What else? That's part of that, 
because if we want to um, ensure mobility without cars, we have to produce. So I would lump that into one piece called behavior change, social change. And yes, this is a very important portion. The way we organize the city, the way we organize mobility, the way we use the system. We can have cars, but we, if we don't use them also. What else? This is just one. Banning diesel fuel, but yes, the change of fuel in today's world, we have a choice between diff different fuel for a car. Diesel, gas, liquid gas, hybrid, electric, hydrogen. For each of the different fuel, we have a lower, uh, we have uh, some different greenhouse gas impact. So choice of fuel can already re reduce. We said that, um, well, I show that energy performance. I wanted you to guess this one. To make the car more e e energy efficient. Because uh, whatever fuel you use, if you have a system, you can make it more efficient than. So, what else? Absolutely, absolutely. But th this is a, a change between uh, what I call eco-driving, car use, behavior, social, societal. Cost. But there is one last piece. There are four blocks, and you can take any system contributing to greenhouse gas emission. There is always four stop. There is the choice of fuel, the energy performance, energy efficiency. There is the behavior vis-a-vis -vis the technique, and there is one last bit. It's related to the way it's a material and manufacturing. To produce the car, you emit some greenhouse gas emission. You all heard about the beautiful electric car called the Tesla. They're beautiful. They run with electricity. But every Tesla before the car makes its first kilometer has a material weight corresponding to 15 tons of CO2 emission. A car produced in France, like a, 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 a Renault Clio, something like that, has a production of eight tons of CO2. It takes many, many kilometers with an electric car to compensate for the carbon footprint to manufacture the, the car. You understand that? This is not understood most of the time. We, we all think that we're going to solve climate change by changing fuel or by changing behavior, or by making it, uh, the energy system more performant. No, it's, we will have to uh, go through the each step. It's not enough to, to save energy through energy efficiency. It's not enough to change behavior and the lifestyle. It's not enough to select the proper fuel. We also have to take into account the carbon footprint of the material. What I just explained for car is valid for your smartphone. A smartphone is very energy efficient. It's beautifully efficient, but it has a huge carbon footprint, you know. This weight only 120 grams, but it weights 120 kilogram of uh, material and the greenhouse gas emission just for the manufacturing. The use is very limited in terms of greenhouse gas emission. And the behavior, I, there is not much I can do. Well, and another story, but we are, so depending on the type of system, you see the portion of what we need to, where we need to play change of fuel, the energy performance, the behavior, the social toll, we call that sufficiency and the material efficiency has an importance. Take the uh, cities, we can, we know how to build cities and buildings with a very low carbon footprint, with a very low energy consumption. But if you produce, if you made this building out of concrete, you know that concrete is one of the, has a worse carbon footprint. So we also have to take that into account. It's only the combination. In the scientific language, we call, uh, in fact, the different footprint uh, through the, Scope. The scope one is a direct emission. Scope two, the emission from the energies that you use. 
and scope three is the indirect emission. So anyway, uh, sometimes the emission uh, local, when I drive the car in Paris, I emit, when I burn some uh, fuel, the emission in Paris. But if the car has been produced outside France, the, the, uh, this is scope three, the carbon emission are from the countries. Like uh, there's a big difference. Like in France, we have reduced our greenhouse gas emission, we only emit uh, six tons of CO2. But this is a emission that we emit from France. But when we take into account all the imports, we have to uh, 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 almost double the figure. All the imported products, all the goods that we import have a carbon footprint that are quite higher. So anyway, we have now 27 years to move from a a trend where greenhouse gas is still on the rise to a low carbon pass. And we have four complementary steps, and this is valid in every circumstances. Change practice and behavior. We call that sufficiency. Let's try to understand where, what do we need? Where are our needs and how best can we provide the needs? Then comes energy efficiency, but energy efficiency, uh, has sometimes a negative impact because we improve the energy efficiency, but we make use of the technology to go twice fast or to go to drive uh, twice longer. So there's what we call the rebound effect. So to compensate the rebound effect of the improvement of energy efficiency, we have to make sure that sufficiency, behavior change, and, and all this come into account. Then come renewable energy. The only way renewable energy will take us to where we need to go if is we reduce demand through energy efficiency and behavior change. Renewable energy, as we, so we can see them today, is not enough. They come on top. They don't replace fossil energy. This is why, I, as much as I love renewable energy, I am always worried when people don't understand the other part of the equation. And then improve carbon sink. This is reducing the carbon footprint of all the material, uh, stopping deforestation, reforesting, and making sure that we make use, we take into account the carbon footprint of every product, every material that we use today. Anyway, if we look at one other system, light, do you know that for each lumen, this is the quantity of light that we have, okay? Between the energy that we burn to transform into electricity, there is already a loss of 67%. So there's only a 33% efficiency. This is a Carnot cycle. Then you transport electricity, you, you have 10% losses. Then at the plug with a standard incandescent lamp, only 5% of the electricity at the plug is transformed into light. Overall, we have a system where only one, the overall efficiency, energy efficiency of the system is less than 1.5%. So the way to increase that is you can go with some advanced technique, you can reduce the losses, you still don't want. The best way to increase efficiency is to change at the demand side. Typically, LED lamp, LED, you know them, they uh, uh, transform half of the electricity they receive into light. Much uh, large impact. And if you on the supply side have go to renewable energy, then you have a greater inefficient. But we live in a world where we are still very, very inefficient. Overall, I think the overall scientific efficiency of our economy is less than 10%. Less than 10% of all the energy that we burn is translating translated into some energy services. We have to revisit our needs. And when we look at the needs, we can draw this type of ground. So it's, I'm sorry it's in front, but we have some needs that are vital. Some needs are, can be essential, indispensable, util, accessories, maybe futile, extravagant, unacceptable, and... Um, uh, Really damaging, yeah, really damaging. And uh, I am convinced that we will not solve climate change if we don't revisit the needs. We don't need energy. 
we need the energy that service that the service that energy provides. Big difference. And depending of the way we consider the needs, we have to have some policy intervention. And uh, there is a policy to regulate. And there are things that we have to make mandatory, and some we have to forbid. And typically, the label on appliances, on cars, on, on buildings that we have introduced in Europe, for instance, is to help the consumer to find its way. You with me? Three examples to conclude, to start concluding, and then we will have a, a discussion. This is an illustration of where we need to go. This is a car. You never have seen that car. You have never uh, heard. This is a car produced in France by some former engineers from Renault. This car is a car of the future because it combines the four steps. First, material. This car has no aluminum and no iron, no metallic part. The chassis of the car, like the body, is made of composite material. Composite material is uh, we use for uh, the wings of the, the blades of the wind turbine. Composite material. As a consequence, you have a car that weighs less than eight, uh, 700 km, uh, kilogram. What counts in a car is not the fuel, it's not the size, it's the weight. And this is where we have to really decouple the use of a car with the weight of the car. The, you, now, once a car like that is ultra light, you can fuel it with hybrid system, with some biogas, with some hydrogen, with some battery, you will consume much less. And this has made the four blocks of material efficiency, energy efficiency, choice of fuel. And of course, when you have such a car, you don't drive fast. So you have the change. And this is an illustration where we need to go. And this exists, go to Gazelle, uh, the dash tech.com and you will see this car and uh, it's a breakthrough and this is really some disruption in the way we conceive a service that we need mobility with uh, in a smart way you may have heard about this plane this beautiful plane Bertrand Picard is a Swiss explorer and he flew the world with this plane the only fuel he used was the sun have you seen that plane before Solar Impulse is the name of the plane. And he flew 40,000 kilometers in uh, 10 or 20 stops, you know, and some stop for. And even during night, he was able to fly only with the sun as a lighthouse. But this is a summary once again. First, the choice of material. To make sure that the plane takes off, you have to have ultra light, light material with a low carbon footprint. Then you have to design in a such a way that every bit is very smart and ultra energy efficient. And um, then the easy part was the solar part. It took uh, two engineers during two days to design the surface available for the solar part. It took a team of 20 engineers doing 12 years to design the other part. The visible part of the energy transition is the solar part, the PV. But the invisible part, but much more important, is to make the design, to design this plane properly. Finally, the behavior. This plane was able to fly at the speed of 140 kilometers. They could have designed a plane to fly twice more, twice the speed like above 200, but they would have multiplied the surface by eight of the PV. So this is where we see there is always a balance between the energy performance and the, the fuel that we can capture. But anyway, this is a disruption beautiful. And finally, this is a building in the south of France. It's um, three-story buildings only produce out of local material, straw, earth, wood, on three stories, only half of the roof is equipped with PV. This building has no air conditioning, no space heating. It is a home of 20 engineers. They work on, only on energy efficiency. 
And this building produces seven times more electricity per year than it consumes, with only half of the roof covered with PV. This is once again an illustration of local material, energy efficiency with all the design, renewable energy, local recognition. And of course, you have to have the right behavior inside. The people here, they know how to uh, behave. They don't open the door and, and when, when, there's no, uh, when it's cold out, outside and so on. Okay. I will skip that, I think. Uh, I'm done now. Yeah. Uh, uh, one more. Oh, I will. I will show you that. When the country discovers underground, it has oil. There's some investment. You first mine, and then you invest, and then you extract oil and gas for the next 20, 30 years. When a country decides to go for renewable energy, you explore, you assess the potential, you invest in the technology, and then you will produce some energy out of the sun here for the next uh, 20, 30 years. We have exactly the same for energy efficiency, but this is not understood that energy efficiency should be considered as a fuel. A fuel, you have to mine it, you have to spend some human resources to understand where can you save energy, where are the needs, how can meet, you meet this need with what type of energy, with what type, what solution. And, and this is why it's very important to have some policy, but energy efficiency is a fuel like any other fuel. And we need to invest. It takes time to extract the savings. But this is a summary of what happened in uh, European countries, this is data from the International Energy Agency. We can see that um, for this uh, selection of countries here, it's, uh, oh, there's even uh, USA here, UK. Mostly. Uh, the total energy consumption is fairly flat between oil, gas, coal, and electricity, okay? Over the last uh, 25 years here. Uh, but those countries have developed some energy efficient policy. And when we take into account the energy that we no longer use to run the economy because of the energy efficiency policy, because of the building codes, the labels, certification, the audit scheme, the tax, and so on, there's a possibility to uh, engage uh, some policy to save energy. And we can see that energy can be and should be considered as a fuel and oftentimes can become the main fuel. So it is possible. We just need to do much more. And um, after me, you will have my colleague Yves Marignac, who will explain the scenario that uh, we think it's possible in France to decarbonize France through the combination of energy sufficiency so behavior change, lifestyle change, what I try to explain, the non-technological part, energy efficiency and renewable energy. And when we, we know that the scenario of business as usual is not sustainable and continue to move in the wrong direction, we can reduce that. And oftentimes when we do that, energy efficiency accounts for a bigger portion of the greenhouse gas reduction than renewable energy. And that's not understood. And energy efficiency has many other uh, impact on security, health, job creation, quality, environment, uh, many, many. Uh... To conclude, we are facing a major transition. What we need to do is not small. In fact, we have to move into the knowledge economy. Only the knowledge economy can take us to where we need to go. In the world, there are two types of resources. We have the finite resources and we have the infinite resources. The finite resources, typically the fossil fuel, minerals, land, sand. The rule is on finite resources, the more we share, the less we have. The more we share, the less we have. We have some fossil fuel, the more we share. Infinite resources are what count the most for us. Knowledge, art, friendship, Love, this is the infinite resources. 
will include renewable energy and energy efficiency. And the rule here is the more we share, the more the resource grows. When I share my knowledge with your knowledge, I'm not getting stupid. On the contrary, we increase both knowledge. Same for art, same for friendship. Same. The difficulty is sharing the finite resources as an immediate impact. It's immediate. Sharing infinite resources takes time. It takes time to build friendship. It takes time to develop knowledge, to go through education. It takes time to build sustainable love. It takes time to build sustainable energy system. And oftentimes, this is what we are missing in this world. We face short-term decision. And we, on the on contrary, we should uh, make sure that we invest in, in, in the uh, development of the knowledge. Einstein said that if you think education is costly to a society, try ignorance. In conclusion, energy transition, I try to explain to you my way that energy if we, uh, transition is comprised several dimensions, but can be explained in a series of Ds. The first D is the decoupling. Decoupling the energy that we consume from the energy service that we need. We have to decouple today the prosperity with the resource that we need. So this is a decoupling. This is a definition of energy performance, energy efficiency. And for we have many opportunities in every sector to decouple the uh, service that we need from the energy and resource that we consume. The second is decarbonization. No need to come back to that. I hope I've been clear on the fact that we have no choice but to move now fast on the decarbonization path. And it's just not one solution investing in renewable energy that will take us to where we need to go. Decentralization is key. We have to now make sure that uh, the decisions are made at the local in every community at every level. Renewable energy are decentralized by nature. This is a very nice opportunity for the whole world. But we have to, we come from a world where the energy was very centralized. The most emblematic part of that was the nuclear power, big nuclear power plant, very centralized. The future belongs to decentralized system to harvest energy wherever it is possible when there is some wind or wind or biomass or a wave or so, so. the energy system will be decentralized but we also make have to make sure that we decentralize the solution and this is where we have a great step to make uh, to make sure that we bring the level of decision at the local level many it has to be demand driven. We can no longer think supply side. We have to look at the demand side. I believe that digitalization can be a blessing. Digitalization is a problem. It's a problem because, as you know, behind your computer, your email exchange, your SMS, your video streaming, and so on, there's a lot of energy being consumed. It's not at all immaterial, it's heavily material, and it has a carbon footprint. But digitalization can also be a tool to collect data at the speed of light, to transform the data into knowledge and knowledge into decision. What we are, I witness, I work in a ministry where I see people are still ignorant on the reality of climate change. They don't have the dashboard in their daily life or as in their professional life, they don't have the dashboard to, to make the right decision. How can you expect, if I ask you tomorrow to uh, reduce your carbon footprint by 40% before next week, where will you start from? Do you know, do you have your own visible carbon footprint somewhere? So we cannot blame population, communities, businesses to not take action because there is not the knowledge. And I'm, I am betting on digitalization to make sure that we transform the data that we collect into knowledge. You should know that in a city like Paris, less than 
of the data that is collected every day is being used. Less than 10% of all the data we have in a city like Paris is being used at all, only a small portion. So we still have some margin. So I believe that digitalization should become a tool for the system. We have to disrupt the way we think, the system, the way we use the technology. We are no longer in the small step here. We are moving in big step. We have to move in this step. And only I'm only interested in disruptive attitude, disruptive technology. No more time for small step. We have to de-silos also. We live in a world where everything is very siloed. So you have those art specialists of this and ultra specialists of that. I belong to a ministry where things are very silos. How can you expect people to share common views and um, we have to decilos our mind. Everything is connected. And uh, I don't know if that's a result of our education, but um, there's something wrong with the way we are. We all become specialists of something, but we know what our neighbor is doing. And the last D, we have to desire this world. I feel that sometimes we don't desire the change that we need to organize. We don't desire a better world for those who will come and live in this planet after us. So we have to move from the sustainable development goal to the sustainable and de desirable development goal. With that, I thank you for your attention and your active participation. Happy to uh, hear the next step, uh, who will uh, share views on electricity, but happy to. Maybe you can go on the other side, Lenore. Uh, we use your computer to connect. Uh, yeah, or you can also share your link. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, you are not connected. Oh. Okay. Lenore, uh, is it uh, is not they, they send the link to you. Can you send the link? They will send the link to your mail. So leave this name. Yeah. Do you want me to share some? Is that your email? Um, it's yeah, L -E -B -O -T, L -E -B -O -T, B -N -Y -P at gmail. Christina. Okay, and you have a click here. Uh, you share? You share the right one or? You come here. <laughs> C 
So yeah, uh, today Angela, Christina, and I will be uh, doing the our presentation as discutants on uh, energy efficiency and first fuel of ca low carbon transition. Um, let's start. There is a clicker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. It's okay. So. <laughs> Uh, so the outline of our uh, outline of our um, presentation is going to be somewhat like this. We're going to do a small introduction, and then I'm going to talk about the current trends that are there. Uh, after which, um, I think Angela will be talking about policy and technology, and then uh, uh, Christina will be talking about barriers to energy efficiency, uh, Javon's paradox, and in the end, I'm going to do a small case study on um, ASEAN and uh, the global South perspective. Um, okay. So we all know after this particular presentation that um, uh, the energy crisis is real and uh, energy uh, uh, sector contributes almost three fourths of the greenhouse, greenhouse gases that are produced. Um, given the particular scenario that is um, happening, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, there has been uh, uh, the debate of how to like uh, improve the situation has been going on for decades now. One of the concepts that has ha that has emerged within th these debates are, are, is that of energy efficiency. Um, so energy efficiency, as defined by the uh, USA government, uh, says that it is less use of en energy to perform the same task or to produce same result. Uh, the quintessential examples that were given and are given usually are efficient homes, cars, um, uh, appliances, etc. And there's a huge buzz around this in terms of like all the marketing strategies and like um, to uh, get into this narrative of being environmentally conscious. Um, however, as Mr. Monsieur Lebeau also said that, you know, it has not been as effective as it should have been or it ha had intended to be. One important thing that we need to understand is the distinction between energy efficiency and energy conservation. Uh, energy con conservation can be a part of energy efficiency, but they're not um, in replaceable terms. If we conceptualize energy as an input um, uh, into production of energy services, that is heating, lighting, et cetera, then energy efficiency is defined as the energy service provided per unit of energy input. This means energy efficiency of a sector or the economy as a whole can be measured as, uh, as, as per the level of gross domestic product per unit of energy consumed in its production. Whereas energy conservation is typically defined as a reduction in total amount of energy um, consumed. These definitions make it clear that energy consumption may be reduced with or without the increase of energy efficiency in itself. Um, why do we... It's, Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, why do we, uh, why are we talking about energy efficiency, especially in the recent um, years is also because of these three other major reasons that we have given. Obviously, there are so many more. Um, but yeah, uh, then this section, oh, yeah. Uh, we have seen that 2022 has been the has had the record high in uh, global energy prices. Um, I think by January, um, natural gases, oil, electricity prices, all of them raised um, uh, had a had an ax for more than two, sorry had been raising for 12 months as a result of post COVID recovery, a series of weather changes, and also the the supply outage because of the war that happened uh, because of the invasion that is happening. Uh, globally, the rate of energy uh, intensity improvement de decelerated from 2.2 from 2010-2015 to 1.4 from over um, 2015 to 2020. Uh, from end of February, after Russia's invasion uh, for Ukraine, there was a, a price hike that that was not seen since 1970s. While Europe had been the center of this particular um, uh, of this particular um, event. The effects and of this crisis was felt throughout the world. Um, in early 2022, um, sh there was a high rises in natural gases in uh, Europe and Asia. And um, yeah, um, yeah, I think so. You can... Uh, I will continue how we can improve energy efficiency. First step is technology, probably the most mentioned one. Uh, but we know that we cannot wait for the new technology to be developed because uh, until it is developed and acceptable at the, uh, and available at, uh, at acceptable price, it may be already too late. And we cannot use the technology excuse to stop doing on energy efficiency. It's 
can be seen as an excuse of doing a bad management related to energy efficiency. I'm going to put more emphasis on digitalization since it has an increasing importance now in energy efficiency. As the professor already mentioned, we can see how digitalization can help from the uh, perspective of gathering data. We are uh, installing smart devices like smart meters, and then we gather the data using the algorithm. We now analyze this data, and then we can change the physical environment based on this data analysis, like changing lighting, heating, and so on. We can use an example of the buildings uh, to see how this can actually work. If you install, because now uh, we have increase of three. Is this working? Okay. <laughs> Because now we can have we are having increase of three percent in energy demand from the buildings than pre-COVID, and we have to decrease this. You, if we install smart meters in every building, and then analyze the data, if and possibly building has the solar panels or any like cell generator of energy, we can use this to measure and uh, adjust this uh, gener uh, generation of energy in the buildings and uh, making the buildings more energy efficient. As we already mentioned, uh, but to, we have to be very uh, cautious about digitalization since it can have like double effect in a sense. We are more energy efficient, but we are buying and installing more devices and then using again more energy. And then we have this right rebound effect that Christina is going to talk a lot more about. But we have to know that digitalization can actually improve demand side management. This, this is uh, initiatives and strategies that, uh, strategies that are uh, optimizing the energy use we are so-called like uh, demand, demand control. So we can use the smart devices to see how our actually energy supplies is standing. And then we can be, uh, do that. We can control our energy usage. So we can have double benefits in a sense, lower energy bill. And of course we are putting less pressure of, on energy uh, grid. Uh, the government also understood the importance of digitalization. Now we have the upcoming EU dig 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 digitalization of energy action plan that is expected to further uh, emphasize uh, this digitalization. Another uh, thing that is very important uh, in sense of improvement of energy efficiency is the policies. Every country should develop certain policies for energy efficiency, should, should implement them in every uh, in every kind of planning, municipality, business, and so on. Uh, this is the figure with the all available energy efficiency policies that was done by uh, United Nations Economic Commission or Europe. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm just gonna mention the most important ones like building codes, labels, minimum energy performance, uh, white certificates, and so on. What I would mention here is that not every energy policy would work the same in every sector, so we have to be very careful in this report. Uh, you also have the so certain countries are reacting to certain energy policies. So if you're interested, you can see. I would uh, more put emphasis here on uh, what is best practice policies for energy efficiency. They should have significant outcome in a sense, significant reduction of energy, complementarity, synergy, and integration uh, that can be easily so integrated in national, regional, international efforts, political alignment, governance, and accountability. So we are, can actually, it's likely to work in a multi-layer governments framework. And then we have marketability and market impact that the sure policy can and will work in global and local markets of uh, supply. I would uh, move from policies into something for me very interesting, lobbying in EU in creating of these policies. As we all know, uh, lobbying is a very common thing in EU. It's, uh, it's not a secret that EU institutions are in contact with organizations and certain groups that are doing a certain lobbying activities. It is necessary process to ensure that we have different opinions included in this decision making some of the big big, big player uh, lobby players are business europe they are uh, they recently did like increased concern about increasing energy efficiency targets then we have fuels europe that recently uh, ex uh, lobbied for exclusion of fossil fuel energy in like uh, energy targets obligations energy saving obligations and then we have heavy industries that are lobbying to implement heavy uh, fossil fuel technology mm -hmm. to continue to use them uh, the most recent example that we have of the lobbying is the Repower EU plan that was implemented last year. And one of the plan is to move away from Russian oil. One of idea is to do diversification of, of uh, oil supply. Uh, this diversification was pushed massively by oil companies and in order because they wanted to improve their uh, pipelines, their grid they had. So this actually works since they received 10 billion euros should be uh, dedicated to connecting the missing links. Another important uh, thing here is 
so-called announcement of joint purchase that was also advised by real oil companies. So there is still, we have a huge conflict on interest. Uh, our Ursula von der Leyen was very public about this. She even tweeted that she met certain CEO executives, certain group of industry experts. Lately, it was, it was revealed that she met CEOs of six big energy companies, one of them Shell, British Petroleum, Total, and so on. And uh, so this, uh, we can see how this means that EU plans to get rid of Russian oil and are heavily influenced by the same companies that are continuous to keep hooked up on the fossil fuel. Uh, this is one of the examples how we can see how we can actually uh, restrict our efforts to improve energy efficiency by actually implementing policies that are not so good. And Christina is going to continue with that. So when we were uh, reading on the energy efficiency, we were kind of wondering uh, that um, uh, it's a measure that is not very conflicting. Uh, it's a measure that is kind of supported by uh, all the actors compared to, for example, phasing out fossil fuels. Uh, that is much more um, conflicting topic. And then uh, we were surprised uh, to see that the progress is still quite slow. Uh, so uh, the energy efficiency report says that uh, uh, in the last decade, uh, there was 2% uh, annual improvement on uh, energy efficiency, but uh, in order to reach the uh, net zero emission by 2050 scenario, we need at least double uh, the progress. Uh, another example of uh, how we are not doing so great on energy efficiency so far is that, uh, for example, in the UK, a uh, majority of households still lives in dwellings uh, with uh, the energy perform performance rating of D or lower. And the uh, last thing also due to a uh, crisis that the uh, we mentioned before, uh, now the waiting time for electric vehicles is one to two years, while for the heat pumps, uh, it's uh, something like six to 12 months. Uh, so why uh, is that? What are the barriers to energy efficiency? Uh, we will be ha very happy for your input uh, to this question, but what we found out is um, first skills. Um, for example, to install a new heat pump, um, you need an installer and to qualify an uh, installer, it needs around three to four years. And there is a big shortage of uh, people like this, of installers, of plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians. Uh, also in production of electric vehicles, uh, there is a, a shortage of know-how in battery production. Uh, second thing, materials. Not only that the, uh, there is an increased prices of raw materials, uh, such as copper, aluminium, steel, uh, refrigerants that are needed for uh, uh, production of heat pumps and uh, electric vehicles. There's also a big problem with uh, semiconductors and uh, uh, other parts that uh, make the production of these uh, technologies much slower. Um, but uh, it's not only about materials, um, and especially for insulation of housing, um, these activities are extremely work intensive, uh, not only for the workers, but also for the households. And in order to um, insulate every one single house, uh, we need uh, an extreme uh, capacity and organizational capacity of not only the workers but also the households and it's not not only this time investment that is needed but also uh, financial investment because um, for uh, heat pumps for insulation for and uh, electric vehicles there are very high upfront costs and uh, it needs kind of a huge investment uh, in order for the uh, progress to happen but uh, we this this kind of comes out from the report, but the, what we saw, these are kind of all the technical measures. By the way, we are mentioning the electric vehicles, uh, the heat pumps, just because it's a much more uh, energy efficient um, uh, technologies than the classical boilers or uh, classical uh, uh, gas engine uh, vehicles. And uh, they were also uh, very um, usually mentioned in the reports. 
So um, we were thinking about the systemic measures that were not uh, very much mentioned also in uh, the report or, or the literature. And that is something that is not only a behavior change of like individual households, but the change of uh, the management that can lead to uh, uh, less energy use while also um, keeping the same uh, uh, purpose. So uh, we were thinking about things like better public transport or uh, trade management and uh, shortening supply chain for less transport of goods or better food management to um, decrease food waste or abandoning plant obsolescence and uh, increasing uh, time of uh, warranty period. And uh, from here, uh, our first question uh, comes out of, um, do you think that the systemic measure uh, measures should get more attention? And uh, how can we maybe put emphasis on that and what needs to be done uh, also in these terms? Um, one thing that is uh, interesting in terms of the crisis that was mentioned is that the burden of raising prices is unfairly distributed both within and among countries, impacting the least able to afford it the most. Um, so you know that uh, uh, high income households consume much more energy, but still uh, it is uh, a lesser share of their budget that for the low income. And while there are some interventions uh, to shield households from the energy crisis, um, the big problem is that the investment to energy efficiency measures is hardly affordable for low-income households, which creates lock-in in the situation of ha having high uh, energy um, uh, expenditures and uh, being kind of locked in in the energy poverty. Last but not least, uh, the rebound effect that we talked about uh, very, uh, very uh, shortly. Um, the energy efficiency is not a conflicting topic. Why? Uh, because it can create a mitigation uh, measure, while it also is often a profitable investment linked with the cost reduction. But that's exactly the problem um, that the lower costs uh, lead to a rebound effect uh, and therefore to stable or increase consumption. And I think we saw this already. It was also mentioned in the report, which says, uh, thanks to more efficient cars, buildings, and industrial facilities, energy demand has stayed relatively stable um, despite the 40% increase in real GDP for uh, IEA countries as a group. Um, so you see, and that's uh, where my uh, last question uh, is coming from, is uh, uh, isn't energy efficiency just another fuel that we are adding to the energy mix um, while not really uh, lowering the consumption and helping the climate mitigation. Um, and with that. Okay, um, so I'm gonna be talking about the ACN perspective. Um, as we saw the particular, um, uh, the map that we saw that Mr. Lebo uh, also showed, the blue space, one of the blue spaces is ASEAN. And um, uh, it is really interesting as a, a, a area in itself because uh, it has had some of the biggest developments in its uh, region. And uh, it, it also has been extremely uh, robust in like consuming energy. While uh, uh, energy demand growth has uh, recently slowed due to the pandemic and price increase, the demand grew by 63% in this particular area, whereas in, uh, globally it was only 24% 20, of an increase in uh, energy consumption. Uh, energy cons uh, consumption in ASEAN has doubled since 2000, uh, fueling a regional uh, uh, fueling a regional economy that now has two and a half times larger than with the cur current population of six, 660 million people. This increase in consumption can largely be attributed to um, urbanization, to the lifestyle changes, and population growth in itself. Um, at the same, uh, 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 while there has been an increase in the consumption of energy, They've also been extremely um, energy intense. Uh, they have uh, achieved the en energy intensive reduction policies as well by 21% in 2018. However, in ASEAN, one thing that we need to consider is that coal is their um, uh, major form of energy consumption. That is how they get their energy. 
industry is the largest um, energy consumer in this uh, in this particular region and it's um, responsible for 44% of the final energy demand um the expected sharp increase in uh, demand uh, will see that is seen will continue especially in asean china and india all these regions uh, in the south uh, in asia and south asian region um, it is expected to go from 76% in 2016 to 78.6% in 2040, but then I think that is, that's going to increase if the development increases by itself. Um, this is some something of a global perspective that is there. So basically, the core countries of OECD and um, the rest of Europe uh, uses uh, on an average 130 gigajoules of energy per capita each year, uh, nearly 10 times more than what lower income countries use. Uh, the world's wealthiest 5% use more energy than poorest half of the global population combined. Uh, more than 3 billion people in low income countries do not have enough energy to achieve decent living standards. So given all these facts and figures, and given the fact that um, you told that energy is also very important for de development itself that is how economic development happens my question is that if if even if we even if the world is um, contributing equally to work against um, the fight against the cl climate change um, is the global south taking the brunt of it for example if there is a person who doesn't have housing the least that they can do is uh, is get a tent and like sit so you know if that is uh, the, if that's it's similar to most developing countries wherein they're trying to catch up with the global development and um they're making the best use of the resources that they have so what would the so what do you think would be the policy implications of this how do you think we can actually um, make sure that development in the terms that it is given to us can actually be uh, uh, integrated with the energy efficiency policies and also what would be the alternatives thank you yeah can we read the questions? Okay. So the summary of the question that we had during this presentation is that first, what do you think about the current EU policies? Most precisely, what do you think EU is doing wrong today related to energy efficiency? Question two, do you think systematic measures should get more attention? How should it be implemented? Third, how to overcome the Javanese paradox so that the energy efficiency progress is not lost through increased energy consumption? And the last one, how should emerging countries approach the additional cost of energy efficiency investment? That's the question. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I have a mic here. So uh, the mic is just for the recording. Uh, well, well, I, I was. I, I like what I saw. It was, uh, uh, it was nice complementary information compared to what I presented. So, good. <laughs> good. Uh, what do you think about the EU policy relating to energy efficiency? More precisely, what do you think EU is doing wrong these days related to energy efficiency? Um, EU is leading the world in terms of energy efficiency policy. Uh, is, EU has um, started to establish a firm policy 30 years ago. I was happy to be involved. And typically, the label A, B, C, D on fridges that we introduce is now being used in 80 countries in the world. I go to Latin America, I go to Brazil, I go to Argentina, I go to Chile. Uh, I can see the label, I go to uh, Russia, I go to um, uh, um, Egypt, I go to Kenya, South Africa, I see the EU label. So at least Europe has done some useful, uh, has introduced some useful policy that can be duplicated. So um, I, I must say that EU is leading the pack. The US has led the pack in terms of energy efficiency on some policy especially on what we call minimum energy performance standard on appliances and equipment. The US was leading Europe catch up, a caught up on, on, on that. Um, we all need to do more. We, EU, despite the good progress, 
has to do more. The way I like EU to move is to now pay more attention to energy sufficiency. Energy sufficiency to come back to the notion of the needs. Um, it's not enough to have an energy efficient car. We have to make sure that the car is also ultra light. This is a notion and there is many ways we can introduce, invent a new series of policy to better take into account this notion of sufficiency. Uh, the, uh, the, on the Givon paradox and the uh, rebound effect, uh, question three, the only possibility to address the rebound effect that is real is to introduce energy sufficiency and some uh, complementary policy framework to make sure that uh, we don't spoil the gain that energy efficiency can offer. And uh, we are not brave enough for the time being. Um, I like the EU to come back to the first question, to just put more money in the transformation of the human minds of, uh, as I said, we have to move in the knowledge economy and, uh, and there's a cost, there's a cost for that. In one of your presentation, you mentioned that there is a lack of skills at local level for the plumbers and the electrician. There is a lack of skill at the architect level. I, uh, if, uh, if I could spend some money, some public money, I would train the architect to understand where the sun is, how it moves over the year, over the day, and just doing that by providing training, developing the right knowledge, we could save a huge amount of energy and we would avoid many mistakes. We are still investing just on, 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 on that. Uh, there is a serious lack of uh, know-how at all level uh, at the plumb, uh, but um, take the case of buildings, architects. Between 2020 and 2060, we will double the level of buildings in the world. We will double, we multiply by two the level of building. The, the, the. Today, we construct, uh, we built every week in the world the equivalent of the city of Paris. Every week, we built in the world the equivalent of the buildings in Paris. There's a huge demand for buildings. Two third of all the new construction in the world is being built without any consideration, zero consideration of climate change, energy, material efficiency. This is insane. This is unacceptable. And we have very few people in saying so. We think we will address climate change through carbon tax. I'm all in favor of carbon tax through renewable energy. I'm all in favor of that but we are failing to understand that there's some fundamentals like training the architects. Can you believe that in the world, two thirds of new construction is being built without any consideration of all what I explained? And it will just take uh, some public money to be channeled in training session, in certification, professional certification at all level. And we really have a great deal of people to train. Only the knowledge economy can take us to where we need to go. But there is a cost and there is, um, it takes some time. It takes time to build, to raise awareness, to build the knowledge and to change the practice. I like the EU to uh, do more. I try to explain also that we have to bring this energy transition at the local level in every local communities in every businesses and um, we are still far far from that objective and this is where i would love also to see more public money being spent on the i think no election should be followed without some training 
of the new elected people, whatever election, local election, national election, precisely also the ministers, they should all be trained as long as it will be necessary, maybe 20 hours on climate change. Ignorance is killing us for the time being. And um, we could set a trend in Europe by making mandatory that whenever there's a election at all level, there's a training that goes with it. Because um, I can hear so stupid things every day on the radio uh, because of ignorance. All what they say on hydrogen, on carbon capture, on uh, hydrogen. I'm sure that some of you are working on hydrogen in your thesis. And I, I, yes, we need hydrogen, but we need on 3% of the problem. But we are putting 97% of our attention on hydrogen. We need some hydrogen to decarbonize steel and, and, and concrete and few sectors, but no more. Why is there, you know, there's not a politician that you hear on the radio, on the news saying, yes, we are supporting the hydrogen economy. What is this? Of course, I love innovation and we have to pro provide innovation, but the most important innovation that we have to support is this knowledge sharing, this development of uh, the uh, capacity, the human capacity. So, um, Europe, I think, should also do better in terms of target settings. We, are, we have a good um, history of uh, data collection, and uh, um, I think the targets are not, um, uh, could, could, be, um, uh, could be reinforced. Uh, we very well know that we have to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, so this is to decarbonize. There are some targets on energy efficiency, there are some targets on renewable energy, but energy efficiency is not enough. It's energy conservation that counts. And uh, I'll be happy to introduce some level of, uh, some targets on energy conservation, absolute reduction. Europe can do better. I was very happy and I started with a slide showing you the label ABCD so that when next time you see that somewhere you will think about me, hopefully. No, maybe not, you don't have to, but at least this is something concrete I, I've done. But since I, we started in 1990, you were not even born. And we introduced the label in 92 uh, in Europe. I proposed a very simple thing that not only we make monetary the label to be visible at the retails, in the retail store, but I propose that we make the label monetary on every commercial, every commercial. There's a, a commercial, buy this, buy that. I was, France has done that for the very first time exactly ago in March, 2022. All car commercial, if you look in the street or in your magazine, all car commercial, there is, it's mandatory now. You see the label ABCDFG. I put, in, I put forward that idea 30 years ago. It took 30 years for France to just make a zero cost policy to say, we will make mandatory on every commercial the use, the, uh, to make sure the, the, the label is visible. You see what I mean? And if you rent a place in Paris, a building, an apartment, it's mandatory to have also the category A, B, C, D. It took so many years. This is a French policy. We have to make it a European policy. The label in Europe is, Exactly the same for appliances. It is not the same label for cars. A B car in France may be a D car in Denmark. This is as stupid as the system is. So we are far from having a coherent policy. So there's some good aspects, like there's some uh, policy, there's some means. And, and uh, thanks God, we have uh, at least those European local directive, and we have introduced some tools, but we, have, we are still missing the, the final step, like uh, harmonizing. We are failing to harmonize the labeling for cars in Europe. So yes, you can purchase today a car that will be B, but you go to Belgium and it will be a C, and you can, <laughs> you can uh, compare online now. How stupid is that? It's just the same car the same car. 
So um, anyway, there's room for improvement uh, at the uh, European level. And I'll come back with that. Question number two, do you think systemic measure should get more attention? How should be implemented? One of the D is to de-silo. And I think this is one of the big, uh, we, we have a trend in this world to get specialized and hyper-specialized. And, 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 and I'm sure that some of you uh, have already engaged in some, some specialty of some sort. And, and maybe uh, you will continue to dig this uh, uh, specialty uh, uh, as you move on in your career. That's good, that's good. But um, I feel like uh, we are suffering from the lack of uh, the, too much silos between us, between individuals, between institutions, within institution. And um, we are definitely lacking systemic measures. Uh, systemic measures should pay more attention. Um, ah. Typically in buildings, you know, um, uh, as I tried, uh, I explained, we are still, con uh, we are building buildings without any consideration. Uh, you know, this is a problem of uh, a silo. This is a lack of systemic nature. How can you expect uh, to uh, make the best of the design of the, of the brain if the architect doesn't have in mind that uh, behind his drawing, his decision, there will be a carbon footprint somewhere. There is, there is no link, so we, this is part of the systemic measure. So yes, I definitely think that uh, uh, more systemic measure. The way to get there, the way to get there, and this is where I bet on digitalization, and you explained that also, that was very nice, nicely complement to what I said, you know, transforming data into knowledge and knowledge into decision and action. I, I, I think uh, what can help to uh, support a systematic approach is to have some common understanding. Hopefully in Europe, we've done something good. The Euro, the same currency across, I don't know, maybe 20 countries in the EU. Um, we are facing a world where we have now to double the level of accounting. We have the accounting in Euro. We have to put a layer of accounting in carbon, carbon emission. And this is where digitalization, knowledge, and carbon footprint, and uh, I, I uh, we should uh, start developing the tools to ensure that we have a common set of uh, indicators. You, you see, so that we share the same radar, that we have our same dashboard. And one way to engage system systemic measure, uh, I think, would be to enhance this. Um, uh, accounting, this double accounting, euro accounting, but also environmental accounting, typically in terms of greenhouse gas emission. And uh, I can see we are starting to see to 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 do that. Question number three: How to overcome the Jevons paradox? So my main response is think energy sufficiency. All this non-technical solution, uh, this non-technical approach, behavior change, lifestyle change, the way we think, the way we conceive society, the way we decide also the debate is part of that. We have to accept um, 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 uh, a high cost of energy. A high cost of energy is important. If the energy is low, we should put a tax. And uh, the fact that we have always failed to put a proper tax on energy when the energy supply was uh, much lower than it is today. Uh, uh, and we should maintain the price of energy, but to accept an energy tax, we have almost a revolution in France two years, three years ago, the yellow jacket. You heard about them, the yellow jacket. You were not here in France, but of course a mess. Just because the government failed to introduce a carbon tax in a proper way. It was just a, a carbon tax without explanation without uh, supporting, um, developing some measure to, to support this impact of the carbon tax. Um, but for me, the tax, accepting the carbon tax is part of this behavior and uh, society change that uh, can help make sure that uh, we will reduce the rebound effect. Uh, how should emerging countries approach the additional energy efficiency investment? 
I'm an engineer, I'm a technician, I'm a real engineer, but uh, I have developing keen interest on finance. And I can tell you that we have all the solution, all the technical solution. I think we know the way, we know the policy and the policy framework that we need to put in place. But what is missing is to channel the proper investments. And today in our society, the investment that the market loves the most is still the brown economy. We, uh, we can blame those investors who continue to invest in coal, oil, and gas. Because I think we have not made the other part of the equation, the renewable energy and the energy agency, attractive enough. And we have to change. This world is about stopping fossil fuel emission and, uh, and, and stopping deforestation. But to stop new, uh, 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 fossil energy, we have to organize the bankruptcy, the bankruptcy of all coal and gas sector. It's a total bankruptcy. We have very few decades now to organize, uh, but in order to make sure that there will be a bankruptcy, but that will be an alternative. I think we have not built the condition to attract investment in the uh, low carbon solution at all level. It, uh, it, once again, it's part of the systemic approach. Um, emerging economy approach to additional cost on energy finance investment. Um, well, that's, that's what comes to mind. We are certainly more of a, more, much more to say, but you have some. Um, The comment is on the like putting the, um, the scope on cities. Uh, there is a paper from two years ago uh, about the Green New Deal in Europe, and they analyzed 250 local actions uh, in the European Union. And what they see is that yes, cities can do things. For example, the best is to invest in like local production of energy, doing it in a renewable way, because like uh, changing buildings is very expensive, and we lack the skills as they showed. But it, in the end, two thirds of the emissions are generally um, outside of the city boundaries. So there is a limit to the space of action there. And then my question is about uh, something that they brought up, which is like more like the political economy aspect. So lobbies, for example, now they just raise the price of uh, Metro in Paris while at the same time they subsidize oil. And uh, so yes, a lot of things can be done, and, and, and but in the end, how do you really fight lobbies that keep pushing for an agenda that is detrimental for the environment and for us? So how, how do you deal with that? Um, yes. Yeah, the power is in the hand of the finance sector and they have the finance and investment and um, this issue of lobbying is um, i don't have a, a, an easy answer i uh, if we accept that there's in the us there's a lot of lobby but on either side in europe we are just building this counter lobbying but we, there's more and more lobbyists on the green part of the equation in Europe, but it requires some investment and um, we don't have access to the same funding. Typically in North America, there's a lot of uh, foundation of all sorts, you know, even when they have produced the worst activity, uh, sometimes the rich people, they suddenly decide to do good and uh, they put some money and they spend a lot of money in a lot of uh, lobbying for the for the right cause. Uh, we are not there yet in Europe. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't think we can stop lobby. We can just uh, raise awareness, build knowledge. Um, I'm, 
I'm part of many uh, discussion in, at the EU level to, uh, I'm part of some lobby, the association Negawatt that will be presented uh, after, this, uh, after the break uh, is one of the lobby in Europe, in France, and also in Europe. And I'm involved in that, but we are still so small. We are still so small. Um, I wish I had an easy answer on, on, on how to best address the be. Um, we have to be smarter than the, the dark forces. We have to be smarter, and that's not easy. But you know, this exchange today is part of that. You know, I really hope that uh, it's great opportunity for me to address to you because you are the future, and none of you, none of you, in the next fifty years, should work on the bronze side of the equation. None of you, you should really reject that. We need brains. We need support. We need your. Uh, if you are here, it means that you are open. If you have stand. In, in, in front of me until now, it means that you have, uh, maybe you can capture a little bit, but um, uh, the, the, this is the future. But no, it's a, it's a long battle. It's a long battle, I must say. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's interesting. You know, I'm a public servant. I work only for public national or international organization. I um, work for the UN, for the OECD, for the French government even today. But I must say that I have learned much more on my side activity. I have co-founded the Negawatt Association. I am involved in uh, several uh, environmental associations. On my, on my uh, uh, free time, in the evening or uh, in the weekends, and I think it's incredible that as a public servant, I have to feed myself um, outside my own mission. And I work, my official work, my professional activities were really focused on climate change and clean energy, but I never had the freedom, even the liberty sometimes to express some views because as a public servant, you have to observe, you have to obey and, and so on. So uh, I don't know why, but uh, I guess it comes from my, my my dad maybe yeah no but it comes from somewhere it comes from somewhere and uh, he was definitely thinking out of the box and that was my um, my way of progressing because I had to swallow many difficult time as a public servant even today at the ministry you know I'm happy to be in front of you to share some views because at the ministry I have to obey and that's not me. So at least I have a double life. So maybe this is an answer to uh, the lobbying. Um, follow your heart and, and, and take, your, take on you if what you believe in is not, um, in the professional environment is not exactly what you, there's room outside and there's a world outside that. In fact, I owe my own career the knowledge I acquired, the, the understanding, you will see a very bright guy called Yves Marignac. He will soon come. He will uh, explain to you the negative. He's very bright. Working on my weekend with a colleague like this one is a beauty. It's a beauty. It's a blessing. So anyway, this is maybe one answer to uh, a lobby is indeed to uh, have some side. Uh, uh, in fact. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I do have a question about the role of the, you, you spoke about the separation of sectors and the separation of countries and the phenomenon that you call silos. So we see today that France is, is facing an energy crisis and many attribute this energy crisis to the fact that France has abandoned its own independent energy policy to be a part of the EU. And so I just want to know that, uh, what do you think uh, about this phenomena? Is it safer and more ecological for France to be, and for the EU to share electricity, to share energy with the associated cost of rising energy prices? Or do you think that each country should adapt its own en energy policy? Uh, that's a tough question for me. I'm not an economist, uh, but a um, few things come to mind. Um, someone said, it's, uh, Nicolas Stern, he was um, the former 
economist in chief at the World Bank, he said that climate change is the failure of the market economy. The market economy has really expanded, especially over the last 20, 30 years. And even the planned economy has moved to the market economy. And we um, have lot of schools of economy saying that the market economy will solve it all, make the, mark, the price right because of the market. This is wrong. And the illustration of that is climate change. And uh, climate change should have never happened in a market economy if everything was right. So um, I'm afraid that Europe is built on the market economy and the European Union is built on the law of the market economy. And I think we, are, we have made some mistake here and I like to see a revisit of this. I don't know how long it will take, but uh, I try to explain that energy is so important. It's a light blood of economic development. And um, I don't think it's such a great idea to think that energy should be part of the market economy and sh everything should be open and we should have competition. I'm not convinced that um, this is a right rule for such an important tool. I'm saying that we, 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 we don't want, of course, a fully planned economy because uh, the, uh, there is some difficulty, but it's got to be another way. And uh, the integration of the of some market is important. I am strong in believer that we have, the more we, uh, the network is more important today than the energy supply. Electricity, you know, the fact that we have to address a new energy system which decentralized, the grid is important. And the greater the grid, the denser the grid, the, the, the better. The, the. And uh, we, because we need to exchange electrons faster and at the speed of light because of this uh, decentralized energy system. If there is wind on one side of Europe, there may not be wind on, on the other side. And, and uh, so this is why I agree that uh, we have to still plan together and um, uh, it's not enough to have a policy at the local level. You have to have national, and in Europe, you have to have uh, this uh, European policy, at least to make sure that we make the better use of the exchange, typically of electrons on the grid. And uh, like on mobility, we have to have uh, the same rules. So um, uh, as you can see, I'm not a great fan of the market economy. I think that we have to revisit. And uh, whenever I hear the, those economists who say that, oh, you just need a price of carbon and the market economy will take, we will uh, yeah, introduce a change that we need to see. No, I, I think that's not enough. Uh, we, the market ac economy can work only if there is some proper signal. We, uh, as long as we don't have the right dashboard, the right radar, the market economy won't properly work. So let's, if you want to maintain our economy in a market oriented business, I think we have to inform it. So, uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, sometimes when you increase the uh, energy efficiency, you're also increasing the gas emissions since you're reducing the cost. So you have more users, and it's actually it's called the rebound effect. It looks like the rebound effect is the history of humanity. The efficiency is increasing, but at the same time, it makes also increase the emissions. And I wanted to know your opinion about uh, this rebound effect, which is, seems like to be a so central. I can explain that the rebound effect uh, has to be addressed now through energy sufficiency. But since you asked that question, let me conclude on the following. I am following with great attention a new association in France. I am part of it. They think that we have no more choice now to go to individual quotas, individual quotas. So each of us, we, uh, we will be given a quota. And then I can tell you that uh, there will be no more rebound effect. Um, uh, we, because the very day that we will have the quota, so I give you each of us, you know, we have to move towards two ton per CO2. Okay. And we start from 10. So today's 10. Next year, it will be minus 6%, minus 6%. And with individual quotas, and this open a new type of conversation. I'm following that conversation. Individual uh, 
carbon quota, and I can tell you that the rebound effect will be, uh, uh, there will be no more rebound effect. But this is an ultimate thing. And typically, Association Negawatt is totally opposed to this. We still believe at the Negawatt Association that we can transform society through uh, a new type of policy, introducing sufficiency, lifestyle, behavior change, carbon tax, and so on, in order to limit the rebound effect. But we have to, yeah, we accept that we want energy conservation. But uh, one day maybe we will have some individual quotas. When I, the more I think, the more I think that we have to pay attention to uh, do, invite some people to talk about it. It's very interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, I would just like to know your opinion about the debate on decoupling that you mentioned uh, and whether decoupling is actually happening and whether it is absolute or relative and whether absolute decoupling is uh, actually feasible in the current technological state. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, my question is about the demand side of energy efficiency. Um, I don't know. Um, there is this famous economist, John Kenneth Galbraith. I know if you know from the US, he was very famous in policy. He has uh, some ideas that became very famous in the 70s about how actually demand is created by monopolies and the private sector. For example, when you think like an SUV, don't you think that it's more propaganda and marketing? They are making people buy SUVs rather than and demand. So I'd like to know if you think it, when you mentioned this side of energy and efficiency, don't you think it's more a side of companies creating their own demand through marketing rather than people, uh, I don't know, having some kind of uh, greed or or they need some enlightenment? Uh, um, maybe, I don't know, if you pass some laws against these companies would be more efficient than targeting behavior. Thank you. So on the decoupling, I can see that we have data in countries like um, France, Europe, we can see a decoupling of um, energy consumption and GDP. And it was even shown in the presentation by the colleagues, 40% uh, increase of 40% of the GDP and uh, the energy immune tax. Unfortunately, one of the reasons of this decoupling in Europe is that we have export it we, we we are we are purchasing some goods outside europe in china and we have delocalized and uh, uh, in china there was the other way around that we haven't seen the decoupling because they are manufacturing so it looks like the decoupling can be uh, possible at a, at a, at at a local level but when we zoom back when we zoom back uh, there is not so much decoupling globally so this is a challenge so uh, when you are an economist or when you manipulate statistics there is always different ways of looking at the indicators and um, uh, what i want to say is that we have still we are we, we still need to make the case we have still to show that we can decouple at the global level it's not enough to decouple at the local level. This at the local level, we can do it. But since a lot of there is a lot of integration, um, we still have a long way to um, make sure that we can decouple or go globally. We have not yet decoupled growth, global economic growth with a global greenhouse gas emission. This is yet to come. We have done so at some at some, uh, in some countries, in some sectors, but that's not enough. Um, this is part of the knowledge economy. We have to, uh, once again, collect the data, make sure that we develop the right indicators and uh, we still don't have the, the radar. We don't have that yet uh, on fully. But anyway, decoupling. And the final point, and uh, when we, try to um, explain that energy efficiency is not enough, that we have to avoid the rebound effect to work on energy sufficiency. Yes, one of the solutions is to really change the fundamentals of the market economy, because the fundamental of the market economy is to build some needs and to force us to think that it is, you will have a successful life only if you purchase an SUV or a big watch, or I don't know what, a big house. And um, 
uh, in the discussion we are having at the Negawatt Association or with other colleagues, um, we always end up with um, the problem of commercial advertisement and the whole market economy is based on creating demand, inventing us and putting, putting our brain in a format to see that, to desire you know, those big cars and so on. This is what we have to change. It's a huge step. I am the one, uh, we are pushing hard to make sure that um, we cannot forbid commercials, but at least we can force like on smoking, you know, anti-smoking, there was a ban in some country of, you know, advertisement. And uh, even in some countries like in Europe uh, and many places, you know, there's no more branding now possible. So I think we may have to go in that direction at some stage just for climate change because market economy continue to put us in the wrong direction. I explained that the label ABCD that you can see now on the commercial in France on cars is going in that direction. I even propose that we tattoo the car, that we tattoo the car so that uh, you can see that this is a G, this is a F, because uh, most of the car are being traded second hand. So uh, just focusing on the first purchase is not enough. Why don't we tattoo the car? And uh, it's, a, it's a zero cost uh, policy, but the world is not ready. Okay. But, uh, one day, maybe, maybe we'll get there because we need we need the signal to make sure that the market economy delivers. Tattooing the guy is a good conclusion. Thank you very much, Bernard. Okay. <laughs>